Hey, would you open your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 13? Mark chapter 13. We've made it to Mark chapter 13, everybody. Come on. Woo! It's taking us like a year and a half, but we're here. We're here. So uh, we've been just kind of going through uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, section by section by section. We have four chapters left, uh, which is going to take us through uh, mid-July, mid-July. We're, we're looking at really uh, the end of Jesus' life, the last week uh, since chapter 11 that started the last week of Jesus' life. And so we're going to be looking at a new chapter today, Mark chapter 13. Now, um, let me just kind of set the context a little bit uh, before we, uh, we kind of jump, jump right in. Uh, I want to title the message for today, Persuasion and Persecution, Part 1. Persuasion and Persecution, Part 1. Uh, normally, I've never really done this before because of the nature of Mark chapter 13, which we're going to get into a little bit right now. Um, I'm going to preach it in two parts. I'm going to preach it in two parts. And just to give you a heads up, as I'm preaching through the message uh, and through the text today, I might just abruptly stop for a second uh, and just kind of call it quits there and pick it up next week. I might not get into the application part until next week. So again, just to give you the heads up, you're like, man, he just stopped mid-sermon. Like, what's up with that? Like, you guess he didn't have a lot of time this week or something. I don't know. But just to give you the heads up, it's a lot. Like, it's a lot, a lot uh, in Mark chapter 13. But today we're going to be looking at uh, verses 1 through 13. And as we've been looking at the last week of Jesus' life, um, it's still Tuesday. It's still Tuesday. And Tuesday was filled with much conflict with the religious leaders of the day. Like they, it was just conflict after conflict after conflict. And now Jesus is going to retreat with his disciples away from the Temple Mount to the Mount of Olives. And this is where we're going to pick up here uh, in Mark 13. Jesus is in the, uh, the Mount of Olives with his disciples. So let's go ahead and read Mark 13, 1 through 13. It says this. And as he came out of the temple... One of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite of the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See, that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. There are but, uh, these are but the beginnings of birth pains. Verse 9. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you, deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this text, Mark chapter 13. It is a difficult text, but yet it is an important text. And help us today as we wrestle through it. God, help us gain clarity of what this text is trying to say for the lives of the people of that time first century believers, and then for our lives today in 2022. God, lead us and guide us in our time together, the power of your spirit. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. So Mark 13, Mark 13. Uh, As you've probably read, uh, as you've probably heard, 
um, and maybe you studied this before, Mark 13 is a very, very difficult passage. I'm just going to be honest with you. Mark 13 is a very, very difficult passage in the scriptures. Uh, I was studying uh, this week on Mark 13, and the truth is that uh, it's very difficult because there's really not one consensus when it comes to how to interpret Mark 13. Uh, Actually, there's about six major interpretations of Mark 13. Uh, So scholars and theologians and commentators really, you know, kind of debate a lot and disagree a lot on this passage. And so I just want to, I want to set some kind of um, uh, the foundation for us to further understand uh, Mark 13 here for the rest of the time together and until we finish this chapter. And uh, he, here's what I want to say. The first thing is that I want to say is we must approach Mark 13 with humility. We must approach Mark 13 with humility. The reason being is because, again, there's much disagreement on, uh, first of all, there's much disagreement on end times regardless, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can, that you can interpret a lot of the end times passages and prophecies. And I mean, we could get really lost in the weeds, but the truth is it's very difficult to interpret. Um, uh, and so the reason why it's a little difficult to interpret is because, let me, two reasons why. One, many commentators, scholars, theologians, teachers believe that Mark 13 refers only to what happened in 70 A.D., Okay, and so we'll go into that in a little bit more. In a little bit more. So a lot of people believe it's this is only about seven A.D. This is not about the end times. Then you have a lot of other scholars and theologians that say, no, no, it has nothing to do with seventy A.D. It has everything to do with the end times. This is an end times chapter, and I actually disagree with both. Uh, I, I, I disagree with both. I believe this passage, and I'm going to show you in a second, actually deals with both seventy A.D. And it also deals with the end times. I'm going to kind of show you a little bit. But uh, again, we got to approach this with humility. For me to say that my interpretation is right and I only have the right interpretation is a little prideful. And so I'm not going to go there. Uh, But again, it's one of the interpretations. And I think it's the best one in my opinion. But uh, you can be wrong if you want to. Okay, whatever. (laughs) But second thing. I want, I want to show you the structure. Uh, I have it on the screen, actually. I want to show you the structure, not just for today, but for the rest of chapter 13. So you kind of have a big picture of where we're headed. So Mark 13, 1 through 23, which we're going to be, break down this Sunday and next, are events leading up to 70 A.D. So they're events that are, it's all about the time of the first century. Mark 13, 24 through 27 are end time events, events that occur at the end of the age. Then it's really interesting what Jesus does. If you really study this passage, he then gives two different parables at the end of Mark 13 that correlate to the first two things. So the first parable uh, relates to events leading up to 70 AD. And then the second parable are events of the end of the age, if you could Kind of grasp that there. Again, that's the big structure that we're going to take for the gospel, for this um, uh, chapter here, Mark 13, just to give you a bird's eye view. Okay, humility, number two, structure. Number three, what happened in 70 AD? Like, why is 70 AD so important for us to understand? You got to understand this that from 44 AD to about 64 AD, the Jews suffered a lot of persecution and humiliation by the Romans for about 20 years. And honestly, the Jewish people, they were upset. They were extremely, extremely upset at the Romans. Now, in 66 AD, Florus, the Roman governor, demanded money from the temple. The Roman governor demanded money from the Jewish temple, and that's a big no-no. And not only that, but the Romans slaughtered many, many Jewish soldiers. And this provoked an uprising in the year 66. Uh, the, the, the zealots started uh, revolting against, uh, against Rome, and a zealot is a Jewish group that had long uh, wanted the Romans to leave Palestine. So in 66 AD, uh, these zealot uh, Jewish men said, hey, we're, we've had enough. We're going to revolt against Rome. And you know what? They had some, uh, some short-term victory. Like they actually were able to gain some ground against Rome. However, that didn't really last long because Rome 
Rome was very, very powerful and gained control back uh, of all of uh, the territory that they had lost during, during that revolt. Then in 70 AD, again, things just started escalating. Titus, the Roman emperor, really took command of all the forces in Palestine, and he laid siege to Jerusalem in AD 70, destroying Jerusalem, destroying the temple. And this siege lasted about five months, which which is relatively short. Um, And so really, uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, uh, he might be exaggerating or not, but he says that about a million Jews were killed and about 900,000 were taken captive during the course of this revolt. And so that's what happened in 70 AD. Now, Jesus has been predicting the destruction of the temple, right? When he talked about the cursing of the fig tree and all this stuff, he was talking about this destruction of the, of, the, of the Jewish temple. And so obviously it happened in 70 AD. So that's why that date is so important. So number one, humility. Number two, understand the structure. Number three, understand 70 AD. And number four, we have to really understand the audience. If you could put that screen Part of the reason why it's difficult to interpret is because there's a lot of audience here in, uh, in this text. Number one, you have Jesus' disciples in about 33 AD, right? So, so this is Mark's account of what's going on in 33 AD with Jesus' disciples, right? Then the Gospel of Mark, uh, there's certain readers of the Gospel of Mark, and so the Gospel of Mark was written mid to late 50 AD, so the destruction of the temple hasn't happened yet, right? So if you're a disciple of Jesus, one of the 12, uh, Jesus is saying, hey, there's going to come a destruction. It hasn't happened, right? If you're reading the gospel of Mark during the first century, your this destruction hasn't happened yet as well. So this was what Jesus was going to say here also applied to, the, to Mark's readers, okay? Then obviously you have the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, and then you have us. The contemporary audience in 2022. So then how do we interpret that? Again, you know, how do we interpret that for us as well? Does that make sense, everybody? I had to do that to lay down the ground rules here and uh, the foundation for us to go forward. Okay, great, great. So let's just look at our, the passage today. Again, I might stop mid, just depending on time and all that stuff, but let's just go, go through it. There's going to be part one and part two. So let's look at verses one through two. It says this, and as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So as they're kind of leaving the temple mount and as they're going out up the Mount of Olives, they're looking back and the disciples say, Jesus, look at, look at these wonderful buildings. Look at the temple mount. Look at how amazing that is. You see, the temple mount was the national pride of Israel. It was one of the great wonders of the Roman world. Much of, his, of the temple's exterior was, was made of gold and white stone. And when the sun hit uh, the temple, it looked like this goldish white, snowy mountain. It was just a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. And so Jesus responds to his disciples after they say, man, what, look at this awesome building. Look at this pride of Israel that we have. Jesus says, there will not be left here one stone. Essentially, it's going to get destroyed, boys. It's going to get torn down. And if you're a disciple, you're like, probably in shock, right? Like, I thought we were supposed to set up the kingdom, not destroy the... What is going on, right? They were anticipating the establishment of the kingdom of God, not the destruction of it. Verse 3, it says this. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, he says, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And so Jesus says, hey, this temple is going to be destroyed. And so the disciples say, okay, well, What's the timing of it? They want to know when and they, know, they want to know what signs will precede the destruction of the temple. They want to know. They want to be prepared. They want to know. I do want to point out one quick note. Isn't it interesting that they didn't ask why? Like, why is the temple not going to be destroyed? They never asked why. But they asked, when is it and what are the signs, right? Right? And then so Jesus, what he's about to do, he's about to give him some things, give them some things that they need to watch out for. Verse 5, he says, And Jesus began to say to them, 
See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. So Jesus says, hey, look, first of all, uh, and these are general signs. He's not even giving them specific things. We're going to get to the specific signs next week. But he's given these general things to look out for. He says, see that no one leads you astray. The word see here in the original language means this. It means to be ready to learn about something that is needed or is hazardous, to watch out, to look out, and to beware of. That's what the word see means, to beware, right? In other words, Jesus is saying, guys, keep, keep your eyes open, right? Keep your head on the swivel, right? Now, what are they to keep their head on the swivel for? What what are they to look out for? What are they to beware of? And Jesus says that many will come in his name. False messiahs, false Christ, false saviors. Jesus warns them about messianic pretenders and false messiahs. He warns them not to be persuaded by these messiahs that will come to lead them astray. There was a lot of messianic pretenders in the first century. Let me just give you two out of hundreds. In Acts chapter 5, the Pharisee Gamaliel uh, describes a man named Thaddeus who claimed to be someone and rallied 400 men around him who were eventually uh, dispersed and killed. In Acts chapter 21, Paul is mistaken for an Egyptian who led 4,000 Jews into the wilderness in a messianic action of some sort. And those are just two examples of many, but there were so many false messiahs in the first century. And so Jesus is saying, hey, beware, beware, beware of these false messiahs. Beware that you're not persuaded by their false teaching and by their false leading. Verse 7 says this, And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are, uh, b- these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Now Jesus says this, hey, beware of these false teachers and false leaders. He says this, though. He says, but don't be alarmed about this. Don't be alarmed about this because the end is not yet. Now, what does he say that we shouldn't be alarmed alarmed about? Or his disciples at that time shouldn't be alarmed about? Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, and famines. What What does Jesus say? Don't be alarmed when you hear about all these natural disasters and wars. He says, it's not the end. He says, it's not the end. But the end is not yet. They're just birth pains. They're beginning of of something that's to come. Now, I want to pause there for a second. Isn't it so interesting? If if we're really looking at this from a 70 AD perspective, isn't it interesting that in our day and even years before us, whenever we would hear of wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, and all of these things, what do people do? The world's about to end. It's over. It's over right? Like pandemic, it's over. Earthquake, it's over. Like Jesus is coming tomorrow. Like that's what we do. But then when you read this here, what does it say? The end is not yet. Don't be alarmed if all of these things happen. The end is not even yet. It's not even here. They're not... They're not signs of the end. If anything, what I think Jesus is saying here is that wars, rumors of wars, famine, earthquakes, pandemics, all of this stuff is part of the normal course of human history and sinfulness. Out of the past 3,400 years of human history, there are only 268 years with no wars. Wars have been going on forever. It's nothing new. So when you hear on things on TV, wars and wars and earthquakes, don't be alarmed. It's not the end. Again, if we take this perspective, don't be alarmed, Jesus says, by natural disasters. Instead, be alarmed by spiritual deceivers. That's his point here. Don't be alarmed by natural disasters. Be alarmed by spiritual deceivers. Verse 9, he says, but be on guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. And you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before the governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. Again, here we see it again, be 
on guard. It's the same word in in the Greek. It's the same word that we saw in verse 5 for see, the same exact word. And again, he's saying, beware, beware, beware. Now, what are are they supposed to uh, be aware of now? They're supposed to be aware of persecution. They're going to be delivered to councils. They're going to be beaten. They're going to have to stand before the religious leaders and secular leaders of the day. They're going to face intense, intense persecution. And notice what Jesus says, and he says it three times. He says, you will. He says, you will suffer persecution. He doesn't say maybe or if or if you're good enough or whatever. No, you will suffer persecution. He mentions it three times. Did you know that all of the apostles, except the apostle John, they were martyred? All of them. All of them. Acts chapter, let me just give you two examples of the suffering of the apostles. Acts chapter 5, verse 40, as they're preaching the gospel. It says, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them to not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. They were beaten. The apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians write about all the things that he went through. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And not the thing you're thinking about. I know there's a lot of people moving in from California. And they just want to make sure what kind of we're talking about here. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all of these things, there is a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. I'm getting persecuted. I'm running. People want to kill me for preaching the gospel. On top of all that, there's a burden and a weight for all the church plants. Notice this, what Jesus says, for my sake. You'll be persecuted for my sake. It's persecution with the purpose. Persecution with the purpose to proclaim the gospel of Christ for the glory of God and the good of God. Of man. Verse 10. And the gospel, Jesus tells him, must first be proclaimed to all the nations. Now, here's the thing. If we're looking at this passage from the lens of 70 AD, okay, what does this really mean? It seems like there's a parenthesis here in verse 10. It kind of doesn't go with the flow of the passage so far. You see, the truth is that, um, again, my interpretation and my uh, understanding of this as we look at it from a a first century perspective is that uh, many believe and many use this verse to say that the gospel must be preached to all people groups before Jesus could come back. That, That that's why missions are so important. You know what? Yes, missions are important. We need missionaries, missionaries everywhere. Absolutely. Many say, well, this verse says that until every people group is reached with the message of the gospel, then that's when Jesus could come back, right? Well, if we look at it from this perspective that I've been talking about, I don't think that's what this passage is trying to say. I really don't. We must remember the immediate context. Jesus is answering a question about the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. Not the end times. So what does this passage then really mean then? Well, the phrase here is not talking about every people group, but the entire civilized world, the entire Roman Empire. Let me just give you one example that is found in Scripture, and there's many. At the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered, okay? So Caesar Augustus wanted to register all all the world. Now, did he really mean all the world? Every single person, all the world? No, he didn't. He meant all the Roman world, the Roman empire, all the known world. And so that's why I just don't think 
that this is a passage that could be used to say we must first reach all people groups so that Jesus could come back. I think Jesus' point here is this, that persecution will not stop the gospel. He's just been saying, you're about to get persecuted. But you know what? The gospel has to be proclaimed. I think that's Jesus' point. Persecution will not stop the gospel. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, as, verse 8, as Jesus ascends, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, let me ask you a question. How was the gospel preached in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth? How did that happen? Through persecution. That's how it happened. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, when there, this church was being ravaged by Paul, who used to be named Saul, it says this, And Saul approved of his execution, Stephen's execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of what? Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So God used persecution, right, to spread the message of the gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, when, when, when Paul is in prison, he says this, For which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to say in verse 10. Persecution will come, but you cannot stop the message of the gospel from moving forward. Persecution does not stop the spread of the gospel. It only ignites it. That's what it does. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And I think that is so true for us today. I might get to some application right now. Because if you just look at the news, if you look at what's going on, man, we're not liked right now. And persecution, church, will come. And it is coming. And it's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. Because any time the church gets persecuted... Man, revival happens. Lives are changed and the message of the gospel moves forward. Verse 11. Check my, okay, okay, I'm good, I'm good, all right. Verse 11. <clears throat> now Jesus is about to go into some specific type of persecution here. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you're going to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his children, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all, of, by all for my name's sake, again, for, for his sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. You know one thing I noticed in this section? Where Jesus says, you know what, you're going you're gonna to be put to trial, you're going to be delivered, don't be anxious, right? Look at the promise. Notice the promise here that Jesus gives believers. The promise is not for physical protection. It's not. He doesn't promise physical protection. He promises the right words to say during persecution. That's what he promises. If anything, he promises persecution. But he also promises the right words to say when we are in times of persecution. He doesn't promise physical deliverance. He promised spiritual discernment and power to be able to proclaim the message of the gospel. And he goes into, like I said, some specific persecution. And brother will deliver brother over to death. I mean, really, there's going to be family division and betrayal. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, doesn't he? Do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. The gospel divides. The gospel draws a line even within our own families. It creates division. And Jesus says, Brother's going to deliver brother. Family member's going to betray family member during this time to be given over to the Romans to be slaughtered. 
the Roman historian Tacitus describes how in the early 60s during uh, the persecution of Nero, many, um, many were convicted and executed on the testimony of others. People were, all, were, were betraying each other. Family members were betraying each other, being slaughtered and executed. And Jesus says, and you will be hated by all. Another Roman historian refers to Christians, again, a first century historian, refers to Christians as a race of human beings given to a new and wicked superstition. The same Roman historian Tacitus refers to them as a class hated for their shameful deeds and followers of a destructive superstition. They were hated. First century Christians were hated. That's what Jesus says is going to happen, and that's exactly what happened. John 15, 18 through 19 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. In other words, Jesus is saying, if the world loves you, be careful. If you're not not experiencing any persecution, if, if everything's fine, you're liked by the world, careful. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Be hated by all, for again, what's the motive? For my name's sake. For my name's sake. A believer's motive for suffering is for the glory of Christ, for the glory of God. Suffering is both a privilege and an opportunity for the believer. Why? Because of who we're suffering Four. And then Jesus sends with this, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Perseverance is proof that our profession was real. Perseverance into the very end is simply proof that our profession in Christ was actually real. So the end here, what does it mean? So the end, but who endures to the end will be saved. What does it mean? The end here refers most likely to the end of one's life, since in this immediate context, it's talking about being put to death. Therefore, those who are martyred will be saved spiritually. So, I think that's what the passage means. Again, it's not a reference to the end times, but it's a reference to first century Christianity. And here's the thing. I think that I got a couple of minutes And I think that even though this passage is not about the end times, this passage is about 70 AD, I think that there's some truths in this passage that apply to all believers at all times, whether it is a first century believer, whether it is believers in 2022, or whether it is believers who are in the end time. I think there's a couple of things that we can really... uh, apply regardless of where we're at. So a couple of things, three, three major thoughts uh, and, and, and that I have to apply. Number one is this, be on guard for false leaders. Be on guard for false leaders. Uh, you see, here's the thing, church. Is, I just think it's very interesting that Jesus could have warned them about so many things, but he ends up warning them about false leaders. And here's the thing, that's such a big deal. Why? Because false leaders... And false preachers and false leaders in the church have a false gospel. And if it's a false gospel, then it's a gospel that has no power at all. And if the gospel has no power at all, it's a gospel that cannot save. Therefore, following after these type of leaders leads you nowhere except apart from Christ forever. That's why it's so important for Jesus to warn believers during that time, and especially now, be careful of false leaders, of false gospels. Now, here's the thing. How do we, how do we notice? What are some things that we can kind of notice about a false leader or a false teacher? I mean, there's, and if you look at the New Testament, there's so many warnings about false teachers. It's a big, big deal for God. So how can we kind of spot one, right? I got a couple of things for you. I have seven different things, and I'm going to go through these very quickly. I'll give you my notes if you want it, but seven things on how to spot 
uh, a false uh, a false leader. I, I learned this a, a while back from a pastor named Colin Smith from Chicago, Illinois. I thought it was so, so good. And uh, number one is this, different source, different source. Where does the message come from? Different source, where does the message come from? The true teacher, right, uses the scripture as his source. A true teacher uses the word of God, God's ultimate final revelation as his source. A false teacher relies on his own creativity, his own message, or his own revelation from God. You know, I I came across, I might butcher the text or the quote a little bit, but I came across a a, a, a quote from a pastor who I really, really admire. And he says, "If if your teacher, your pastor, constantly goes up to the pulpit, It says he has a message from the Lord and dreams and visions and revelation, but never opens up the scripture. Houston, we got a problem. And we really do. What's the source of what they're teaching you, right? Number two, different message. Different message. What is the substance of the message? For the true teacher, Jesus Christ is central. Jesus Christ is is the substance and the message of the pastor's sermon or the leader's sermon. False teachers speak about how other people or other things can change your life. Not how Jesus is is essential to conversion and transformation. So, number one, different source. Where does the message come from? Number two, different message. What is the substance of the message? Number three, different position. In what position will the message leave you? If you listen to this message and apply it, in what position will this message leave you? The true believer is escaping corruption and pursuing holiness and sanctification, while the counterfeit believer is mastered by corruption and sinfulness. Number four, different character. What kind of people does this message produce? What kind of people does this message produce? The true believer pursues godliness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, all of these things, right? But the counterfeit Christian with the counterfeit leader is marked by arrogance, slander, sin, all of the works of the flesh. Number five, different appeal, different appeal. Why should you listen to this message? The true teacher appeals to Scripture. God has spoken, and the true teacher appeals to his word. So the true teacher asks, what has God said in his word? The false teacher asks, what do people want to hear? What do people want to hear? What will appeal to their flesh? What will tickle their ears? Number six, different fruit. What result does this message have in people's lives? The true believer is effective and productive in his or her knowledge of Jesus Christ. The counterfeit is like a spring without water. They promise much but produce little. And lastly, number seven, which which was what I started at the very beginning, a different end. Where does this message ultimately lead you? Here we find the most disturbing contrast. The true believer with the true leader will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of of Christ. The false believer will experience swift destruction. That's why Jesus tells us that there will be many, many, even many leaders who will be involved in ministry in his name. But Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me, I, I never knew you. So, number one, be on guard for false leadership. Number two, Be on guard for persecution. Be on guard for persecution. I'll have the band come up as they close this out. Be on guard for persecution. I read some stats this week that's in total, in total, there there are 70 million total Christian martyrs up to today. 70 million Christian martyrs who were persecuted and slaughtered and killed for their faith. 70 million. 45 million in the 20th century. In the last decade, there were 270 new Christian martyrs every 24 hours. Be on on guard for persecution. I read a story of this man in Africa. In 2020, he 
His home was burned down. They have physically attacked him because of his faith. Armed men broke into his house, attacked him, attacked his family because of his faith in Jesus. As a result of this violent attack, his leg had to be amputated. Because of this, he was discouraged as he struggled to provide for his family. He couldn't work. But thankfully, there's a great organization called Voice of the Martyrs who came alongside of him, supported him, provided for him. But he did say, man, my faith is shaken. My faith is shaken. It just happened last year all across the world. Maybe we don't see it here in America like this. We have brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world that are literally hiding in basements, hiding in homes to not put their life on the line, running from danger, being persecuted. It's happening. It's happening. For us, maybe again, we don't really deal with that type of persecution, but maybe we deal with people speaking badly of us, being passed over for a job opportunity. And I think this one hurts the most, being excluded by family and friends because of your faith. That hurts a lot. Persecution will come. I was kind of thinking about it. I was thinking about the pastors in Canada where it's essentially illegal to try to convert someone's sexuality. So what does a pastor do in Canada as he's preaching through Romans or 1 Corinthians or 1 Timothy and he gets to a passage like that? What does he do? Does he not preach it because he's going to get arrested, put all over the news? Or does he just preach it? I hope and I pray that he preaches it. Come what may, that he preaches it. Why? Because persecution is only an opportunity to spread the gospel. Be on guard for false teachers, be on guard for persecution, and lastly, be on mission. Be on mission. Persecution will not stop the spread of the gospel. Be on mission. Be on mission. Here's the thing I really need you to get this, to get across today. Jesus called us to proclamation, not speculation. Jesus called us to proclamation, to proclaim the message of the gospel from the rooftops, not speculate of when he's returning. When it comes to end times, we, there's just so many specula- so, so much speculation. A lot of time lost about trying to figure out when he's coming. By the way, no one knows. Debating over pre-trib, post-trib, all mil- doesn't matter at the end of the day. He's coming. He's coming. And we need to be ready. And we need to take as many people who are far from Christ with us. That's what really matters at the end of the day. We're called to proclamation, not speculation. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for this text. Although it's difficult, there's so many things that just are true. True for your disciples as they were with you on the Mount of Olives and you were warning them and encouraging them. True for first century believers who were running away from Romans. Running through the mountains of Judea. Escaping for some who were even standing up for you, proclaiming the message of the gospel. There's so many, there's so much truthfulness to your disciples, to a first century believer, and even for us here in 2022. It's the same thing. And it's gonna be the same thing for those who 
make it to the end right before you come. It's the same. May we persevere to the end, not being persuaded by all of these messages, not being persuaded by different gospels, not being scared of persecution, but standing firm and standing boldly for you, Jesus. That's what matters. God, we honor you and we thank you in this place today. In your mighty name we pray.